OK, we are live and good to go. Uh, I'll turn it over to you, Fred. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Turning stuff over to me is, is very <laughs> ineffective. Um, well, we'll start with your chair's remarks. Do you have anything you'd like to say for an opening? OK, well, the chair's remarks are we've been. Um, oh, it, it, it's a little creepy here on the latest computer in the other room. Um, oh, yeah, we've been, as I said in the, my, my email, we've been doing a huge number of things in a very complicated way. And if somebody else wants to take over his chair, um, I would be glad to have more time to attend to other responsibilities. What we've been doing here is sorting huge numbers of specimens and writing a report about the, the endangered Avavaria hickory nut mussel in the Ottawa River. And um, and we're maybe we're moving towards incorporating what we've done as a uh, not for profit uh, fragile inheritance. Um, I'm, and, and, and we've been so much sort of holed up at home that I don't think we've actually set foot on more than about 150 meters into the South Nation drainage, which is a little bit embarrassing. But uh, I guess those will do for Chair's remarks. Thank you. And I just heard Doug and Sean come on. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. We just started. Hi, Derek. Hello. So good just. Afternoon. Just so everyone knows who's on board, I'm just going to do a quick roll call. So we have Doug uh, Hoover, we have uh, Sean Landrio, Francis Abraham, uh, Alvin Cl uh, Cliff Clyborne, uh, Bruce Clark. Uh, Don McMillan is joining us today to cover for Ed Fields, who was not available to attend. So welcome, Don. We have uh, Fred and Alita, uh, Kirk. Mydell, Larry Smith, Malcolm Clark, and Stefan DeBuck. And I don't think I missed any committee members. Uh, Doug Thompson, I just saw you come in as well. All right, so the first item uh, after Chair's remarks is uh, the approval of our agenda. There is no supplemental package today. Uh, so, looking for a mover and a seconder to approve the agenda as submitted. Thank you, Larry. I saw your hand go up. And a seconder. Doug Thompson. Thank yeah. you, Doug. Does any have uh, anyone have anything to add to the agenda? Bruce, you have your hand up. Did you want to add something? Oh, you're you're on mute, Bruce. Your unmute should be up the top right. Hey okay, Bruce, we can come back to you, but you're you should be looking for a microphone on the top right if you want to unmute yourself. Okay, so, Mr. Chair, we have a mover and a seconder for the approval of the agenda. If you'd like to call the question. Oh, you're, you're Sorry. muted, Fred. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am muted. Um, are there any opposed? I don't think we have an opposition, but Doug, your hand was up. Did you have a question? No. Sorry. That's Still all right. Getting it down. That's all right. Uh, number three on the agenda is a declaration of conflict of interest. Does anyone have any declarations for this agenda? Uh, seeing none. We'll move on to our staff uh, Fish and Wildlife Project update PowerPoint show. Now, what about the minutes from last meeting? Oh, uh, they'll, they'll come up right after the slide deck. So okay. we'll get to them right after this. Uh, so uh, first up for updates, um, as many of you are aware, South Nation Conservation has been working with Ontario Power Generation's Regional Biodiversity uh, Program for a number of years. We're currently in a three-year agreement and Michelle will touch a bit on some of those activities when we get to the stewardship work plan. 
But I just wanted to let you know that we have submitted another three-year request uh, to OPG's Regional Biodiversity Program, again for $75,000 a year for three years for a total of $225,000. Uh, we submitted four main projects uh, in that uh, three-year period. The first being Healing Spaces, A Journey to Reconciliation. Uh, we've, I think, mentioned a few times to this committee the healing place that we established at our property in Shanley uh, last year. Um, Abraham is part of the working group that has helped driving that project along with uh, several others. So we're hoping to do some additional development at that site, as well as create two new healing spaces uh, over the next two years, um, ideally one in uh, Algonquin and one in Mohawk traditional territory. We'd also like to enhance uh, some of our communication products and get some information online regarding the healing place and reconciliation. So the weaving Western science and traditional knowledge through two-eyed seeing is uh, work to uh, blend those two ways of knowledge into some of our communication products and get some information on our healing places online. South Nation River Oak Valley to Cass Bridge is a shoreline restoration and buffer planting project. So we do have some significant erosion right at Oak Valley that we're hoping to be able to repair, as well as planting some culturally significant trees on the stretch of the South Nation River South Branch between Oak Valley and Cass Bridge. And the final project's uh, SNC Forest Cultural Values revisit some of early partnerships we had with First Nations back in the early to mid 2000s around black ash, medicinal plants, and wild rice. So we'll be looking to revisit some of the sites that we worked on back then, do inventories on how some of those species are doing and possibly some restoration work. So we're hoping to find out later this month whether or not we're successful. Um, so we'll let you know at the June meeting uh, where things are at. Any questions on that before I move on? So the black ash, is what what's being done? I know, I know that at Aquasasne there, they're trying to preserve some. Um, is there anything we can do on South Nation territory to, uh, to to get some black ash to survive? Yes, so Pat or Chris would be better to answer this question than myself, but I do know that back in the early 2000s, we did have a black ash project where we developed a management strategy in partnership with uh, the Mohawks of Aquasasne. So we have a couple of properties that are flagged where we're trying to help protect and cultivate the the black ash so part of what we'd like to do through this OPG program is to go back to those sites to see how well they're doing do they require any restoration or mitigation work again to help um, uh, protect and, and grow those uh, those black ash that were on those properties so we have done some work uh, we continue to identify them through our inventories and we continue to work uh, where we can with um, with MCA to make sure that they have a supply of black ash. So it is is something that's on our radar, Fred, when we do our forest management. Right. Abraham, but, I don't know if you have anything else to add from MCA's perspective. I mean, I think like our black ash approach is still in development, um, not fully completed because I'm really thinking about the cultural continuity of how we're going to do this. So black ash and ash trees in general are an important part of basket making, which is not like an important part of the identity of Aquas Oslono. And with the Emerald Ash Borer coming through, um, <clears throat> I'm being concerned about, you know, what is actually the point of planting any more black ash trees right now? Um, just considering that when they reach a certain size, the Emerald Ash Borer will get into them, and that'll be that. So um, becoming like a, you know, an environmental hazard in the long run from the Emerald Ash Borer but these are just general ideas. Um, I'm looking into seed saving for the long term, um, but also I'm seeing some innovative research out there that um, there is some genetic resistance that is coming up. Um, but I also kind of, I'm, I'm just kind of concerned, just gathering knowledge and sort of thinking about the ways that we're going to preserve that for future generations, when at some point maybe we will be able to plant black ash trees and white ash trees again. So, um, it's kind of a part of our development that I'm going to embed into our approach with the Two Billion Tree Initiative, um, but it hasn't been fully fleshed out. So um, 
but it's inspired a lot by my research that I did through for my master's thesis. So there's quite a bit of groundwork that I've already laid for it. It just kind of needs to come to fruition, get a forester in MCA structure and push the project through the door. Um, and sort of examples of that with like the healing space, building one of those in Akwazasana is really going to help us provide that basis in our organizational structure that these things are necessary. Um, in the long run. So that's my little spiel on that piece there. Um, but I'm hopeful. <laughs> so maybe some sort of seed saving program, maybe. Well, yeah, seed saving is a good idea because you get some of the diversity. One of the things we're doing with the green ash on our land is we're just going to, as soon as they're attacked by the ash borer, we're going to cut them down and, and let the sprouts grow up because there's a certain size below which the ash borers don't get at them. And, and maybe if the biocontrol of the ash borer comes through, um, they'll be able to, to sprout up again. We have, we have one ash tree that was cut down by a, a neighbor boy when he was in his, his sort of rowdy stage that's now a pretty substantial tree. And so that gave us the idea. And I wonder if with the black ashes, I mean, I don't know if they sprout as well as the green ashes do, but just to, to cut a bunch of them down and and let them sprout and hope that the biocontrol wasps are going to reduce the, you know, the virulence of the ash borers. Yeah, and, and, you know, my a lot of what I'm talking about is, like, hope for the best but plan for the worst situations. I mean, one of my dream projects is to um, align myself with one of the island communities along the coast um, that own an island that is more than three miles away from the coast and then have some sort of preservation landscape out there. But, you know, like, these kinds of things take time. And um, just kind of one of those dreams I hope to make possible in the long run. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. And, and there, there are people in Nova Scotia that are fretting about black ash, too. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so this slide just talks about a new partnership that we've started with Ducks Unlimited Canada. They reached out to us and to Rideau Valley Conservation Authority for some help in securing approvals from Fisheries and Oceans Canada for some restoration works they want to do on a whole bunch of their old uh, wetland creation projects. So they received some funding from the province uh, near the end of 2020 to do a whole bunch of uh, wetland restoration work. So they have a list of uh, about 60 projects that they want to tackle this year in 2021 to do uh, mainly it's, it's refurbishment of the existing kind of uh, control structures they have for these projects. But they need, obviously a lot of them will require requests for review from fisheries and oceans. And uh, they reached out to us for some help with that part of the, the process. So we're working very closely with them, helping them fill out all the forms um, understanding what mitigations they're going to have to put in place when they do this work and uh, hopefully be able to get out and check out some of the projects as they're happening. So it's ongoing. It's a, a one-year uh, project. They have to finish all of this work in 2021. So uh, we'll keep bringing updates as things move along. Right now it's very much just in the kind of information gathering and, and uh, putting together the paperwork. Mm -hmm. This next slide is about our natural heritage system study. Uh, hopefully you were able to tune in to one of the uh, public outreach sessions that were hosted. We had one uh, February 9th for residents in Stormont, Dundas and Glengarry and the other on the 10th for residents in uh, Prescott and Russell. So this study is a joint partnership between the two counties to come up with a natural heritage system that covers the whole um, area of both counties. So we've been working hard on this project and we had draft maps um, prepared and, and they are on our website. The, the um, address is at the bottom of the slide there where you can take a look at the maps. You can see from the photo in the slide, there's the kind of the dark green cores and then the, the corridors are the lighter green bands. So we're really looking for um, public feedback. If you haven't already submitted any, any kind of um, feedback, feel free to do so. There's uh, forms online that can be filled out with information that you want to 
contribute. And all that stuff is being gathered and um, collated, and then we're going to provide it to the counties for consideration. Uh, whether you know maybe there's uh, tweaks are going to happen to the to the linkages or the cores, or there's something interesting that we hadn't heard about before. So um, it was pretty good. We had about 250 tune in to to the sessions. So very good public turnout. Um, I guess that's one of the benefits of hosting virtual meetings is you're likely to get more people to tune in than would show up to a community center. So um, it was nice to be able to engage. There was some on some chats happening, some questions and, and uh, answers after the presentation for both those sessions. So there was, it was nice to be able to interact a little bit with the public. So if you have any, uh, any questions, um, you know, I'd be happy to answer them, and and I definitely recommend you check out the the maps. Larry, go ahead, Larry. Uh, Michelle, has there been any negative feedback? Uh, I'm concerned about agriculture because the battle for land in eastern Ontario is so uh, it's such a hot topic. I was wondering if you had any negative feedback. No, actually, the um, the I tuned into the session in SD and G, and it was it was all very very positive. Um, I'd have to talk to our the our staff involved in looking at all the feedback they've received so far, but I think I think it was well explained in the session that that these linkages don't you know that they don't restrict the agricultural properties and that agriculture is an important part of the linkage. Um, so I, I think it, overall it was fairly well received. Thank you. Right, and this next slide is about um, headwater drainage features that uh, we're going to be sampling soon. So uh, as you know, we're in March and then hopefully April we'll have a, a good freshet coming not too fast. Um, so in the, around mid-April, we start looking at sampling headwater drainage features because that's at the point in time when these things have water flowing in them. They're very small uh, streams that are on the landscape only for a short time in the spring, but they are important in terms of conveying flow and nutrients and, and um, structure and stuff to downstream areas. So uh, we're focusing on the South Bear Brook catchment this year. This is the second year of a, a two-year study we're doing on the catchment. Last year, we weren't able to do the headwater drainage feature sampling because of the, the restrictions with the pandemic. So we're hopeful that this year we'll be able to get out and, and get that sampling done. So all those green dots are the sites that we're targeting to do um, the sampling for this. So we'll be up in, in that area of Ottawa. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this spring, we'll have a little over 229,000 trees reserved for 120 landowners. This includes the 50 million tree program projects, including refill, um, our over-the-counter orders, the rose forest planting, and the municipal tree giveaways. Um, last year, due to complications caused by COVID, uh, staff were called in to help plant trees so that the perishable trees were not lost. Um, since it worked so well last year, uh, staff will again be helping to plant trees this spring. Uh, we'll be working with 69 landowners under the 50 million tree project and we have over 50 orders through our over-the-counter program. Um, in June of last year, based on positive feedback in the 50 million tree program that we gathered over the winter months, we, sent, we set an ambitious goal to plant uh, 200,000 trees this spring. Um, and we're very happy to say that with all the hard work that staff have put in, that we've not only reached it, but we'll surpass that goal this spring. Um, since 1990, the last highest tree allocation was in 1993, where SNC planted 196,000 trees. And since 1990, SNC has planted over 3.3 million trees across the jurisdiction and will reach 3.5 million this spring. Vernal Pool uh, construction was completed in the summer of 2019 and monitoring plans were set to begin early spring 2020 to watch and listen for amphibians using the new pools. But once again, uh, COVID complications altered our set plans. 
Uh, fortunately, Environment Canada or Environment and Climate Change Canada was able to loan us four autonomous recording units. That's the green boxes that you see in the picture there, uh, which I installed at both Vernal Pool properties. So I collected water depth uh, readings at each of the 10 pools for most of the summer and into early October. Um, the recordings haven't been analyzed yet, um, but the hydro period for each of the pools has been compiled. Uh, we submitted our final report to um, ECCC. Um, unfortunately, though, uh, what the results that we found were that the drought had shortened the amount of time that the pools held water. Um, as a result, uh, the only amphibian that I observed was a clutch of American toad tadpoles, but they dried up in the heat before the metamorphose, uh, before they were able to, to metamorphose to their terrestrial form. So um, luckily, we'll be working again with um, ECCC to continue monitoring the vernal pool water depths and also deploying even more ARUs on South Nation properties. So we're going to hopefully have um, enough to put on the two vernal pool properties, but also some of our other properties. The, the autonomous recording units can be used to uh, capture bird songs as well. So there, there was interest on their part to, for us to collect um, some uh, recordings of birds for the breeding bird atlas. They're up, updating that atlas and so uh, hopefully we'll have some properties because that information is also valuable to us. Uh, all of our properties, we gather um, information to put into the baseline documentation reports and having the uh, species of birds that we find on those properties is um, useful information that goes into those documents. Um, so if anyone is interested in volunteering to listen for Western cord course frogs in either Shanley or Bourget, uh, please let me know. And, and I'd just like to say, uh, yeah, I'm not muted. I'd just like to say that um, the course frogs Oh, when we have these early spring droughts, we get this thing that Naomi's described where the tadpoles don't metamorphose and, and the chorus frogs are thought to be an annual species generally where they, the eggs are laid one year, they breed the next year and most of them die. And so if anybody can listen at any place where they've heard chorus frogs in the past and and they've they've calibrated themselves to know the difference between chorus frogs and peeper trills. Uh, it's going to be very important this year, especially in our part of Ontario. There's other parts of Ontario where it was pretty wet last year. Um, to see if we've lost populations of chorus frogs. And um, Alita and I are working with um, Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society to go up to Renfrew County and listen there. and. We're working with Vance Trudeau at the University of Ottawa to develop a captive population of chorus frogs so that they will have tadpoles to release into these vernal pools if they aren't colonized by local chorus frogs. The, the chorus frogs, because they're annual, they need to have connections between different pools that have different hydro periods. And, and the, the pools were dug to have different hydro periods. But of course, last year was a very extreme year. That's right. And if anyone um, is wondering, I do have recordings of both uh, the peepers and the Western course frogs so that you can learn the differences. So um, if that's the part of the, the monitoring that it intimidates you, um, there is some kind of self uh, training that you can do just to, uh, to learn the differences. So. Um, you know, if, if you, you're considering it or thinking about it, uh, feel free to let me know and I can send you the links for those uh, recordings. Um, on the Ontario Power Generation Biodiversity Grant funded some needed erosion repairs at J. Henry Tweed Conservation Area, area and uh, some invasive alien buckthorn management at our Gamble and Garlandside Road properties. 
So um, the Garland Side Road property is located northwest of Limoges, Limoges um, and there was once a mill on this property, but now the mill pond site is infested with buckthorn. So the buckthorn is mainly concentrated in that area, but it uh, has also started to spread from that site outward into the, the rest of the property. Um, buckthorns are found throughout the temperate and subtropical northern hemisphere, hemisphere as well as parts of Africa and South America. So we do have some that are native to North America, but they're not the ones that seem to be infesting our, our, proper, our, our forests. Um, buckthorns have few natural predators in Ontario and can reduce the value of forested stands by completely overtaking the understory and can, and can impact the forest's natural regeneration process. Um, they can also starve surrounding trees by creating more shade, which, which causes the trees to grow more slowly. So they're, they're spread mainly by birds. Um, the birds do seem to uh, eat the berries, even though they don't seem to really prefer them. They will eat them in emergencies. And of course, uh, you know, they help to spread their, their seeds. So that's something I'll be working on um, in the near future is developing a plan to, to reduce and hopefully eradicate the buckthorn from these two properties. Um, we do have other properties that have invasive alien species, including buckthorn, but also things like Phragmites, and they sort of have all the same type of impact on our properties. <clears throat> they tend to outcompete other species and um, overrun the area. Um, you know, they can become infested quite, um, quite heavily. Uh, Phragmites um, can become almost like a monoculture where nothing else grows. <clears throat> and because there's nothing that really eats the seeds of Phragmites or uses the plant very much, it um, takes up space from our native species that would provide food and shelter and, and good habitat for our, for our species. So uh, this is why we, we want to try and control them. And um, it's always an expensive battle. So hopefully we can get a handle on, on at least these two properties and see how it goes. Good afternoon, everyone. Good to see everyone today. Um, so usually, um, well, actually, every February, uh, at the end of every every February, David Fitch and I, uh, we go out and uh, we do uh, some ice sampling on the South Nation River. Um, about 17, uh, 16 sites. We start up, I think, around um, geez, Oak Valley, and uh, we sample. We have uh, stations set down through the river and. Um, been there doing that for 17 years and couldn't believe the thickness of the ice. It's so thin this year. Uh, we didn't get that cold uh, weather that we needed. And um, we just had snow on top of the ice and it insulated everything. Um, we had about an average total uh, out of the 16 spots. We had about uh, an average of six inches of ice. Couldn't believe it. Um, 14 inches of ice in Russell right above the dam. And uh, with that thinnest ice right there is... Um, Right where everyone was ice fishing, actually in Castleman, right where all they have the shacks. Um, see, the thing is, is where all the uh, the skidoos and everyone travels on the ice. It packs the ice, or sorry, it packs that snow, and you get what you get is white ice, and it's uh, very weak. So, um, yeah, it was a good thing we were out there. We were able to put out a, a press release, um, and I think all the shacks are off. Out about 30, uh, 35 shacks. I think all the shacks are off the river now, down in. Uh, uh, right where the, uh, the the caster comes in, uh, so that's good, and it also gives us a, a handle on um, any type of uh, ice jams that we could be accumulating over the freshette. Uh, we have to keep an eye on that. So uh, there's a lot of water out there. So we there's a lot of water out there um, in that snow. So we got to make sure that uh, everything's going to be good to go for the spring freshette. Um, and I think we're going to see uh, I, it's going to be a lot of water. That's all I'm going to say. I don't want to jinx it, but uh, yeah, thank you. Kat, did you want to add? Sure, um, sure thing. Thanks, thanks, Fronda. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, Kat Watson here. Um, I just wanted to bring everyone's attention uh, to the fact that uh, SNC hosted the annual flood forecasting and morning webinar yesterday. And um, at that webinar, there were presentations on uh, spring freshet preparations by um, the Ottawa River Regulation Secretariat, the International Lake Ontario St. Lawrence River Board, 
Um, there was a spring forecast for Eastern Ontario given by uh, Peter Kimball from Environment and Climate Change Canada. And then um, SNC staff um, also presented a um, sort of a, a current watershed conditions presentation. And um, uh, that, that presentation is, was uh, recorded and is available. And, and I'll just, um, I'll put the link actually in, in the, in the uh, chat for this meeting in case anybody wants to check that out. Great, thank you, Kat. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say for the those of us who are the Canadian Library of Drifted Material that we're looking forward to a lot of shells being washed up on the shores this spring. All right, so that is the end of our slideshow. So we'll move on to um, item number five on your agenda package, which is the minutes from the November 24th uh, meeting starting on page uh, three of your agenda package. Uh, Hoover and seconder right. to approve the, the minutes. Oh. If I could have some, uh, anyone interested in moving, a show of hands or just wave at me. I see most people, yeah, but not Sean. all. Thank you, Sean, and I see Alvin, thanks. Are there any questions or corrections on the minutes from November 24th? Okay, I'm seeing none. All right, Mr. Chair, we have a mover and seconder for the approval of the minutes. Uh, we are ready for the question. Okay, uh, is anyone opposed? See none. Carry that motion. Thank you. Uh, first item up in new business is found on page eight of your agenda package. And again, every year for all of our standing committees, we do hold election for the position of committee chair. Um, the first step in the process is to appoint a um, acting chair in order to run the election. So I will uh, right now seek a mover and seconder for the following rec recommendation. That the committee members appoint Rhonda Boats team lead special projects as the acting committee chair. And further that the SNC administrative bylaw 15.3 colon all elections shall be in accordance with the procedures for election of officers be adhered to. We can have a mover and a seconder for that motion. Bruce, thank you. And I see Malcolm's hand up too. Thank you. Any opposed? Okay, that is carried. All right, in order for the following uh, procedure for the election. So I will declare the position vacant. I will then call for nominations from the floor. I'll make three calls for nominations. A reminder that the nominations do not require a seconder. Uh, if your name is nominated, I will confirm that you wish your name to stand and we'll take it from there. So as acting uh, committee chair, I declare the position of Fish and Wildlife Committee Chair vacant. And this is the first call for nominations for the position of chair. And just a reminder, you may be on mute. So if you wish to nominate someone, just ensure your mute is off. I have a question. Yes. Uh, when Fred was saying that he would uh, give up the chair, has he? Does he want to give up the chair, or he's just? Well, you can nominate him, and we'll, and we'll ask him formally. <laughs> if you'd like okay. to nominate him, Alvin, we can formalize the question to him. He's been doing a good job, and uh, I would nominate him, but I'd only. I don't want him to feel obligated on my part to keep it. Well, well, go ahead, I'll nominate him. Thank you. Okay, if there's if there's strong insistence that I stay on as chair, I'll stay on as chair. Okay, great, well, I'll make the second and third call and we'll see where we go. So this is the second call for nominations for the position of committee chair. And third and final call for nominations for the position of committee chair. Seeing none, I then will just require a motion to appoint uh, Fred again as the committee chair. So 
the resolution will be that for the year 2021 and until the Joint Standing Committee meeting of 2022, the Mr. Frederick Schuler be elected as the chair of the Fish and Wildlife Committee. A mover and a seconder for that. Doug, thank you. I'll second that, Doug Culber. Thank you, Doug. Doug and Doug. Any opposed? Congratulations, Fred. You're any any words as chair? <laughs> All right. I'll All send right. Uh, I'll send Fred a bag of clams. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. I'm sure he'll appreciate yes. that. Yeah, maybe that would be a condition. Everybody has to send me a bag of clams. Yeah, that, that's fair enough. Because anything's better than being the uh, moderator in some of these wild face meetings that we have. Yeah. All right. Anyway, thanks, Fred. Thanks, Fred. Thank you. Okay, we can move on to the committee membership report, which is the next item on the agenda found on page 13. So again, every year we do confirm membership on all of our standing committees. Um, the recommendation for committee membership then goes to our board of directors at their annual meeting, which will be held later this month for ratification on the membership. So on page 13, it's a rather long um, resolution, so bear with me as I read through it. The Fish and Wildlife Committee recommends the following committee membership to the Board of Directors for 2021. Malcolm Clark, Russell and Fish and Game Club, Bruce Clark, Ottawa Fly Fishers, Alvin Clough Clyborne, Russell Fish and Game Club, Joff Cody, Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry is a non-voting member, Doug Kluver, Naturalist and Recreational Angler, Stefan Dubuc, Trackper, Ed Fields, Delta Waterfowl, Abraham Francis, Mohawk Council of Aquasosny, Susan Gallagher as a private citizen, as a non-voting member. Cyril Holmes, Grenville Fish and Game Club. Alita Karstead, Fragile Inheritance, Natural History. Sean Londrio, private citizen. Kirk Meidel, private citizen. Frederick Schuler, committee chair. Larry Smith, South Nation Archery Supply. Doug Thompson, private citizen. And with all of our standing committees, our board executive is ex, ex officio, which includes uh, SNC Chair George DeRoos. SNC Vice Chair Pierre LaRue and SNC Past Chair Bill Smurl. So looking for a mover and a seconder to put those names forward for final approval to the board. Thank you, Larry, and thank you, Doug. Any opposed? We are good to go. All right. I believe Michelle is up next. Yes, thank you, Rhonda. So my report starts on page 15 of your agenda package. So we, we started doing this a couple of years ago where we bring our work plan to the committee for feedback and comments so that we can have an idea of any um, new projects or, or different work or ideas that the committee would like to see in the next year's work plan. So what I've brought to you today is what we have planned for 2021 as per our board approved 2021 budget. And I'm asking for comments and, and feedback so that we can incorporate any changes or additions in our 2022 uh, work plan. So on a very high level, some of the things that we have planned for 2021, uh, you can see it's kind of broken down by the different programs we have. Um, we are planning to do some stream assessments and uh, complete a subwatershed report card. We've been doing this annually for quite some time now, so um, that's something that we will continue to do. Uh, the City Stream Watch, working with um, volunteers to assess part of the stream, we're going to have to see how that works with uh, the pandemic. We weren't able to work with volunteers last year, so we'll have to see how this year uh, works out in terms of getting volunteers to help. If we can't get volunteers out, we still hope to do the work ourselves. Um, it'll just, just be a little bit different and maybe not as nice for people who would have liked to come out with us. Uh, we have our clean water program planned, our Ottawa Rural Clean Water Program and the Eastern Ontario Water Resources Program. So these are all those um, cost share grants that are provided. So we do um, a lot of the organizing for the committees for those, uh, the administration, all of that, that work that has to be done. We are also doing, or we're hoping to continue, I should say, our Ottawa baseline monitoring. So this is a series of 12 stations that we took over from the City of Ottawa a couple years ago to do the grab samples, monthly grab samples on behalf of the city. 
so that that long term data set could continue because the city had to had to reduce how many sites they were doing. So the CAs were able to pick that up. This project is supported by special levy. So we'll have to um, we should find out in May that that is um, whether that's moving forward. We also do annual benthic sampling at all those sites as well, just to get some extra um, water quality data from there. We have habitat restoration on the books for this year. Uh, for the Leitrim Wetland, we do host the Leitrim Wetland Advisory Committee. We have two meetings a year and we provide a annual shrub giveaway to Finley Creek residents. And we also support um, any community stewardship projects. We've been asked to organize um, stream cleanups in the past. Um, in the past, we've attended some of their community events. So again, with the pandemic, we'll see how that plays out, but um, we're still active in the Finley Creek area. Rhonda mentioned the Ontario Bi Power Generation Biodiversity Project. So our, this is our existing uh, agreement under that program. We're into year two. As Naomi mentioned, we're going to be doing a lot of um, buckthorn removal on the Garlandside Road property and then uh, a lot of ash tree removal required on our Gamble property, as well as uh, replanting and, and uh, some restoration at those sites. And then the J. Henry Tweak Conservation Area, our engineering team is busy right now working on the design for the erosion repair that we're doing at three locations in that park. So we will um, continue working on that with the actual construction happening next year for that that site. We will be doing some site preparation. Um, there's a lot of ash trees in that park as well that we're going to be um, have to come out in terms of our, our work areas. For East York Creek, we provided um, three, three locations along East York Creek, which is in um, Embrun. There's three areas where there's some significant shoreline erosion that um, we recommended for repair. So we're partnering with Russell Township to um, target one of those sites and, and do some repair along that creek. We have the Species at Risk Benefits Exchange. So if you remember, this is a 20-year agreement we have in place for bobolink and eastern meadowlark habitat. So we've, uh, we've been monitoring the habitat for the past five years already for, for nesting bobolink and eastern meadowlark, and the sites are doing quite well. So we're going to um, continue checking out those sites this year in terms of uh, determining whether we have to do a, a mowing in the fall or not to keep the the woody material down. There's some d areas of dogwood and and uh, some shrubby stuff that that grows up that we have to keep um, down to keep the grassland going. And then uh, we're also working on, like I mentioned, the South Bearbrook catchment study. We're in year two of that study. Um, and then uh, we were also hoping to look at um, maybe doing some work in a different sub watershed in terms of uh, some, you know, some studies to help support safe and sustainable developments. So that's what we have on the books for 2021. If you have any feedback um, or ideas for what you'd, what you'd you know, like to see in 2022 or your project ideas, feel free to um, send me an email or, or you could call and uh, we'll, take that all that stuff into consideration when we start planning for 2022 all of our um, activities. Doug, you have your hand up? Question? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you, uh, Rhonda. Uh, Michelle, uh, thank you for that update. I, I, this might not fit into uh, what you're discussing, but I know that, uh, <clears throat> that South Nation purchased a property uh, off Grays Creek Road, uh, I think it's off the Marcella Drive, just uh, south of the village of Greeley. Yep. And there was some discussion about, and I know I talked to Pat a couple times about uh, making a pathway or trail through that property. And, and we had to wait until we gained access to to that particular property and i think we have now so i i'm not sure if uh if you have if this fits into your uh workload or who it would be because i'd like to find out uh, the size of that property and what uh, are the plans for the future sure yeah that would be under our our um the property section of the budget but uh yeah we do we do have the access now towards that property and actually um at the end of last year we installed um a weather station there so 
um, it's a, a good site in terms of it's also collecting some really important data for us as well. But I will I'll make a note, Doug, and um, maybe I'll get uh, Pat or John to follow up with you on on any potential future trail development on that property. Yes, that that would be great. And if they could include what you just mentioned that you do have a station there, because I'm I'm preparing a. Uh, a report from the Greeley Community Association to the city uh, on the new official plan. And one of the things that we want to include in our uh, report or presentation is uh, work that we're doing with uh, uh, forested areas. Uh, so that would be helpful if we could get just a little summary of uh, what's taking place there. Sure. So the recommendation for this report is found on page 15. The Fish and Wildlife Committee receive and file the 2021 stewardship work plan update. And further that, Fish and Wildlife Committee members provide comments for consideration on the 2022 stewardship work plan deliverables. Looking for a mover and a seconder. I have Alvin moving. Thank you, Alvin. And seconder. I see Doug Thompson's hand up. Thank you, Doug. Also, uh, welcome, Bill Smurl. I didn't see when you joined us, but I didn't have your name uh, in the initial roll call. So uh, welcome. Let's see that you are on. The uh, So we have a mover and seconder. Uh, we can go ahead with the question, Mr. Chair. OK, I, I just want to say before um, moving the questions, it, this is a bit of content for this, and it's really long range. But I've been involved with a group in Lanark County, and, and as you, everybody, some people may know, the Friends of Lanark County have been working really hard against their county's spraying of, of nominally spraying parsnip along the roadsides, and and actually spraying a whole bunch of other things. Um, and and so there, this group is sort of a, a branch off of Friends of, of Lanark County, and 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 they're moving towards doing what they call healthy roadsides, and and perhaps a direction that people in general or conservation authorities should be looking at is is working at. Um, biodiversity along roadsides and, and native plants and and native grasses which have a, a tremendous tremendously more root mass than than the invasive grasses um, to try to sequester carbon in prairie like soils and try to make our roadsides like tall grass prairie and of course there's a problem with the grass being a meter and a half high for roadside safety but but that's just a a thing that I'm starting to fret about, um, and and it I mean there may be OPG money to do something along that in along certain roadsides, and so if there's any opposed to accepting the question. Okay, we actually have uh, Abraham's hand up. So just before we call the question, go ahead, Abraham. <clears throat> oh no, I was just I wanted to say like I really do support this like comment that's be our question that's being proposed. It's a really interesting um, direction to take, and I think like an under underseen topic um, because that fringe habitat right along the like um, roads and like right along the tree lines and stuff is some of the most biodiverse um, areas. And I don't really think I, I don't tend to see very much done about that or, you know, specifically there are strategies to plant specific grasses that don't grow out, grow as high or bushes or something that allows to kind of control for that those things. So I just I thought that was really interesting and thank you for that awesome question. And just for your information, a reminder that we do with um, United Counties of Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry plant roadside trees along some of their county roads. So that's a program that's been in place for several years. So we're targeting areas with a, with their roads crew that are safety hazards in the winter. So we're looking at building uh, living windbreaks, basically. And we have uh, had a few conversations around doing wildflower plantings, too. So I think that's, that is something that is uh, is on our radar, certainly. All right. Hey, Mr. Chair, you can, I think, now go ahead and call for the, now, uh, the vote on that. Now actually call the question. <laughs> yeah, 
And seeing none opposed. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. With that, we will move on to the next report, which is on page 18. Um, and I mentioned in the first slide that we have had a long-standing partnership with um, many uh, local First Nation communities. So the report on page 18 uh, is an attempt to capture at least some of the work that we've been uh, doing, have done, and are planning to do in the future. Um, so I was not planning to go through in any great detail unless there are questions, but we did summarize uh, Chris and I some of the projects that we worked on. So of course, there's the Eastern Ontario First Nations Working Group that's been active for quite some time. Uh, uh, part of that is um, requirements that we have as uh, our forests are certified under the Forest Stewardship Certification Program. So there is a principle directly related to Indigenous people's rights. Uh, so that is something we work with a working group to ensure that all of the group holders um, you know, are doing uh, what they can to engage with local First Nation communities. I mentioned the Black Ash Partnership again that we're hoping to revisit under uh, a new OPG biodiversity project along with the municipal plant uh, work that was done earlier. Uh, we've shown you in the past the Edible Buffers project that we created in 2018-2019, uh, which was funding from EcoAction Canada. So again, that was a great opportunity to bring traditional knowledge into that project as well and plant culturally significant fruit and nut trees at four sites across South Nation. Um, there was a great video that OPG did to highlight that for some of their work. Um, they supported a portion of that project, so I provided the video link. It's on our YouTube channel if you're interested in seeing that again. Uh, we've spoken about the Healing Place again, the site that we have in Shanley and the, and the one that we hope we'll have shortly at uh, Aquasocity and another location in Algonquin Territory. So again, hoping to see some support through a new uh, OPG proposal on that one. Um, and... Uh, Potential Species at Risk project as well. South Nation uh, partnered with Plenty MCA and the Algonquins of Pickwaknagon to, um, to submit an AFSAR, so Aboriginal, um, sorry, forgetting what the F stands for, <laughs> so can, uh, Species at Risk uh, grant that just went into. So again, hoping to see some funds to do some uh, species monitoring, Aboriginal funds for species at risk, that's what it is. Uh, so that's just a quick snapshot of some of the uh, projects that we've been working on and hope to uh, work on in the future. So that was just for your information. Uh, so do you need a motion to receive and file and happy to, to take any questions. I'm looking for a mover to receive and file. Come on, there's got to be somebody. I see, I see Bruce. Bruce, are you okay to, to move that? Great. And Kirk, we'll have you second. Perfect. Thank you. And we can go ahead with the questions. Okay. Sure. Uh, move the question. Unless there's discussion, move the question. Is anybody opposed? None. We will move on to the next report. Um, this is a report that Pat Pitts brought to our forestry committee that I thought would be of interest to Fish and Wildlife. So I'm not going to do it nearly as much justice that Pat did for the forestry committee earlier in the week. So if you do have questions I can't answer, I will be happy to pass those along to, to Pat and Chris. But we did want to bring back an update on the Emerald Ash Borer Parasitoid Release Project. I know that there were questions last year and if we'd heard any news back from that, um, the work that we've been doing with the Canadian Forestry Services. So there was a delay in getting data back again because of the pandemic, but we have heard back from um, CFS, Canadian Forest Services, and Pat put together a really nice uh, summary on page 21 of where things are at for that. So again, just a reminder that we did partner um, to release three parasitoid wasps for um, possible biological control of the emerald ash borer. Um, Canadian Forest Services started releasing in 2014. They themselves have released over 240,000 wasps. And again, these are very tiny, look like green of pepper in your hand uh, wasps. Um, they provided training to staff and South Nation staff started releasing on two of our own properties in 2017 through to 2019. 
Uh, we did not have any releases last summer because of the pandemic. We were not able to get a supply of wasps. So you'll see the three species listed there on page 21. And um, total together, there's about 21,000 that were released over the, um, the 2017 to 2019 year period. Uh, the two sites that we have uh, in our area are Two Creeks Forest and um, a property on uh, just off of the 138 near Monklin. Uh, these two sites are two of 27 that were established through the provinces of Ontario, Quebec and New Brunswick. Uh, we did have uh, Canadian Forest Services come out and take samples in 2019 of the areas where the wasps were released. Um, they took the trees back to um, their lab in Sault Ste. Marie and they were held in cold storage and then the intent is to rear the parasitoids to see if the populations have established. Uh, with COVID-19 it delayed the ability for them to actually uh, rear the parasitoid wasps. Uh, however they were actually able to finally late last fall um, finish that piece of the work. So they have provided some feedback on what was found. So um, one of the species, and I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce the uh, scientific name, uh, was found at the Monkland site, but not yet at Two Creeks. Um, there was a small quantity of the second one found on both sites, and right now none of the third found on either of the two sites in our area. However, it should be noted that three years of sampling really is needed to determine whether or not there's a viable population. So the one sample set is not enough to, to say whether or not um, the population is established. So there is plans uh, to continue sampling. So they're hoping to sample again this fall, um, as long as there aren't restrictions due to the pandemic. And from what they've learned um, since they've started releasing in 2014 um, at our and other sites is that once the populations are there, they have the ability to spread um, up to one and a half to five kilometers per year. So it's still early in the study to know whether or not this is a, going to be a viable bi biological control for the emerald ash borer moving forward. But again, it's good to see that the research uh, support is still there and we're hoping that uh, we'll be able to do further sampling and hopefully some additional releases this summer um, if uh, COVID restrictions allow. So again, uh, Pat has a lot more information um, on this. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer, and anything I can't, I will pass along to Pat to follow up with you. Yes, Phil. Yep. Maybe Bill needs to unmute. Okay, uh, yes, I'm having trouble with my mute and my different things. Um, and also, I asked uh, Pat at the last meeting where these wasps were um, from. And they got them from the States, the United States. And they now have the ability to breed them and, uh, and put together uh, colonies here in Canada. And so uh, they will be looking at, as, as Rhonda said, more releases. And uh, Rhonda, for your information, I was on and heard your... Um, your uh, introductions and I noticed I was missed, but I just have sort of been monitoring from the side. Thank you very much. All right, so the um, resolution on page 21 is the Fish and Wildlife Committee receive and file the update on the Emerald Ash Borer Parasitoid Release Project. Looking for a mover and a seconder. Alvin, thank you. And Larry, thank you. Hey, Mr. Chair, we're ready for the question. Okay. Move the question. Any opposed? Well, I guess we haven't heard any opposition. <laughs> We'll move on to page 23 of your agenda package. It's Michelle with the funding submissions update. Thanks, Rhonda. So this is the um, table that we bring to you regularly, which outlines all of the grants that we have applied to or are in process of applying to for funding for various projects. And uh, we update the status each meeting so that you have an idea of which ones were denied or approved or still waiting on. So. So these, this is the, the current list as of December 2020. So you can see there's a, a couple that we've heard back from, unfortunately, which were denied. And then um, 
This we have one under the water and erosion control infrastructure program, which was um, approved, which was great because initially that one was it was denied last year, and then there was um, extra funding that was available, so we ended up getting that project approved for some important work at the Castle and Weir uh, concrete assessment. So that went ahead. Um, the Great Lakes ones, unfortunately, were were denied. We were hopeful to, to get at least one of them, but um, that wasn't the case. So we're we're um, going to keep looking for other grants to be able to apply for those projects. And then we have a whole bunch that are pending still. Uh, the Climate Action and Awareness Fund is a federal uh, grant program. We submitted back in November. We we're hoping to have heard by now, but it's still up in the air. So hopefully by our next meeting, we'll have heard back on that one. The Grasslands Ontario uh, one was submitted in January. This is one where um, we're going to be doing some habitat enhancement and hayfield rejuvenation for our newest property, which is um, also the one where the, the healing place, there's a uh, portion of that property that's um, been hayfields for a while, but um, and, you know they've they've been left a little bit and, and could use some enhancement and some rejuvenation. And we're also in discussions with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada to potentially do some research um, on the enhancements that we do and, and on um, work with their crop scientists to look at the soils and the, the, um, uh, the crops on that property. So that one will be interesting if we are successful in that one. There's also monitoring for Bobolink as part of that that grant and we we do know there's bobolink on the site it's it's quite a good site for bobolink and then as Rhonda already mentioned the Ontario power generation proposal so we're hopeful on that one and um, the habitat stewardship program it says in progress but it was actually just submitted uh, March 2nd so that one's gone in for some um, to purchase some of those autonomous recording units that Naomi described in the slideshow we're hoping to install some of those on SNC properties to do forest bird monitoring, um, specifically for red-headed woodpecker. So the, um, the amount is to purchase some more of those units for ourselves. We have a, a slew of grants under the National Disaster Mitigation Program that uh, we're hopeful to hear about this month. And that involves a lot of flood forecasting work, flood risk assessments, um, and a big LIDAR acquisition project. So those are our big ones we're waiting on. Um, Rhonda mentioned the Aboriginal Fund for Species at Risk. That one is uh, submitted, so that one's uh, done, as well as the Eco Action Community Funding Program for Oak Valley. We did submit that one as well yesterday, so I'm um, hopeful that one will, will be successful. We had applied for it last year um, and were turned down, but after discussions with the rep, um, she made some, some pointers and gave us some feedback on where to improve the application and, and strongly suggested applying again. So we're hopeful on, on that one as well. And then we're working with um, the United Counties of Prescott and Russell to submit a proposal under the Canada Healthy Communities Initiative to do some low impact development at um, the LaRose Forest, one of their sites. So that one's in progress and will be submitted March 9th. And that's uh, the most up to date listing right now for grants. Bill, you have your hand up, go ahead. Thank you, and I got it off mute. Um, when we receive a, a denial, do they ever give us information as to why it was denied? And and I heard your comment a minute ago, but you, that you had a discussion and one was later um, uh, confirmed. So when they do a denial, is there any chance of knowing why and, and having the opportunity to reapply or re-ask, or is it finished in most cases? Uh, no, they typically, um, most of them, the, you know, you get a standard response that, that usually it says there was so many applications and limited funding, but if you have further questions, they, they will list a, a contact. So what that's typically what we do is if we are denied, we follow up with the contact and, and uh, usually it's a phone call where you kind of walk through the application and they'll give you specific feedback on where, uh, where your application ranked and where you could improve it to resubmit. So in the case of eco action, it was suggested to resubmit it the following call for proposals. And that's for most of the grants, that's what it'll be. You'll have to, you know, we would have to wait until they do another call for applications. For the water and erosion control infrastructure, it was, um, they had projects that didn't go ahead and ended up with some extra funding. It doesn't typically happen. So um, that one we were, you know, it was, it was lucky for us that we were ready with a project and um, it had scored fairly high in the initial application. It just, 
at that time it wasn't quite high enough, but with the projects that didn't go forward, it, it then, you know, it bumped up and, and was able to be funded. And a supplementary question, um, under the National Disaster Mitigation Program, you're right, there are a slew of applications and they're rather expensive applications. So would they sometimes be granted in entirety or in part or what usually happens there? Is there any usual? Uh, yeah, that, I mean, there's it, a lot of the applications, we could receive partial funding. So we've had that in the past. Um, OPG, for example, is one where um, one of the, it's a three-year project and one of the years they reduce the funding a little bit. So that does happen often and, and we adjust our, we adjust the project to suit the amount of funding that we receive. So um, it's, it could happen it, it, that we receive, you know, only a portion of the funding that's possible. And, and another supplement, if I may, and when um, we do get a grant, uh, are they often a percentage? And is it 50? Is it 100? Where does that fit in? And that means we have to find dollars in our own budget. Yep, they vary. Um, some grants are 100% funded. So, for example, the Canada Healthy Communities Initiative, that <coughs> requires no matching funding at all. It's 100% okay. funded. Um, eco action is 50 50 so we have to have 50% um, matching and in the case of that project um, the 50% where we're finding the matching is coming from Ontario power generation so we do that often where we um, where it's possible we can use other funding sources as matching um, the Aboriginal fund for species at risk that one required 20% in matching so a little bit less which is which is nice uh, so it, it varies depending on the, the grant program, how much matching we do have to have. Um, the Great Lakes Local Action Funds, those were 100% funded, so it's it varies. Thank you. If there are no additional questions for Michelle, the uh, resolution on page 23 is the Fish and Wildlife Committee receive and file the grant submission update, looking for a mover and a seconder. Alvin, thank you. And Malcolm, thank you. Okay, and so we'll move the question if there's any opposed, but but I want to say that that we just have to appreciate the heroism of the staff in applying for all of these things and, and the terrible conditions that you have to meet and how you have to distort what you say about what you want to do if you want to do what you need to do. And, um, and Alita and I were through this this summer where we we were applying for funding that had been made available. To EFO and museum staff couldn't go out and do the work. You had to be married, so you were sleeping with the person you were working with, so you didn't have to worry about the pandemic. And, and it was a drought-dependent protocol, and the money didn't come through until the drought was ended. <laughs> so we went out and we spent a better part of a month going out and looking for a clam, and we only found one of them. So. Uh, so if there's anybody close to receiving and filing and commending the staff for their work on this. Um, and, and Mr. Chair, if I could add as well, not only are they heroic at going out and looking for these funds and being quite successful, every time they get dollars coming in, that supplements the amount that's put in by the municipalities. So if we get 30 to 50 percent of uh, money from grants, that means we're able to do twice as much as the dollars the municipalities gave to us. I right. see Kirk's hand up. Kirk, did you have a question? No, sorry, I don't know why it's up. I'll put it down here. No problem. Mr. Chair, we can go back to your question then. Okay, are any opposed? So it's filed. Okay, so we do not have a supplemental. So we can move on to correspondence. And just for your information, we included um, Conservation Ontario's comments on the Drainage Act regulatory proposal, and I'm going to lean on Michelle to help me out on this one. If there are any questions, Michelle, is there anything that um, you'd like to highlight for the committee um, on the review? Uh, you no, know, it was pretty straightforward. Um, we didn't have any, um, I guess, major concerns. Um, just a few, you know, what Conservation Ontario submitted was what where we had concerns as well. So. Um, we'll see how that plays through when the regulations come out. Um, but in general, I think it'll help with some of the, the really minor projects that 
at this point have to go through and, and have a drainage engineer appointed, go through the whole process of, of doing a report, um, which is quite expensive and quite time consuming. So, um, you know, in, in those those few cases, it makes sense and, and we're supportive of that. I see Abraham, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Hey, um, I know how exhausting it is writing grants all the time. Um, and sometimes coming up with ideas to do things is always can be quite challenging. Um, and I appreciated that long, um, well, that list of stewardship activities you were involved in. Um, just a strategy to help with the process is um, working with some summer students to write their own proposals. Um, specifically summer students from the local community. Um, I did that with my summer students last summer and I ended up producing like seven different proposals that I was able to that I can submit for funding. Now I mean I have to massage them and put like you know the detail and whatnot in it but the idea was there and the connection and the creativity. So just saying that that's a really fun thing to do um, and a really great way to get the youth perspective and voice engaged within your conservation Thank that's you a really, idea. yeah, that's a good idea. I like, I like the idea of getting students involved because you might be surprised too by what they come up with. They might have some different ideas. And it's really wonderful because like this is such a great resume builder, a great skill to provide them. You know, like I, you know, like that's just one of those pieces where actually like five of them I'm going to invite back to implement their own projects. So I think that that kind of stuff becomes this really nice way of building that next generation of environmental technicians and conservation people, because um, <clears throat> we are going to live forever doing this. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that, Abraham. All right, so we're on to our roundtable portion of the agenda. So we'll start with uh, an opportunity for anyone to share any community engagement activities uh, that they've done over the last little while. Um, and uh, maybe what we can do is, I know Don's been waiting patiently to uh, give an update from Delta on behalf of Ed. So maybe Don, if you're ready, we can start with um, the Delta waterfowl update. Thanks very much, Rhonda. Uh, like most organizations, uh, the local chapter for Delta waterfowl here, we've uh, suffered under the pandemic and this is some of the limitations that that imposed on us, especially in the areas of our youth program, the annual youth hunt. Uh, we weren't able to host that last uh, last fall, and it's not looking promising for this coming year. So we've got a couple of different approaches. Uh, about three years ago, we the local chapter we installed, I think it's 22 nesting structures on property owned by uh, the Conservation Authority, just west of the Church Road and uh, Highway 401. And we go back and check these nesting structures each year when there's still some ice where we can get out to. Uh, um, we're finding uh, we had a mix. We had a, a number of wood duck boxes and we had a limited number of tent houses, a tubular structure that is aimed or focused at getting uh, mallards to nest in. Our wood duck boxes have been fairly active, which is a good thing. We Two weeks ago, we were out and just did the, the clean out and get them ready for this nesting season. The uh, tubular structures aimed at the mallards in our particular area have not been successful. We only had five of them, but none of them have actually um, been used by the ducks. And this is different than what Delta is seeing in many other areas. So we're taking a look at how we might modify the structure, because what we're finding is uh, other birds in the area come and take the nesting structure apart and go away and build their own nests. So, we're looking at maybe uh, covering them up with a bit of tin to uh, make sure that they stay intact and see if we can improve our success. So that's one of the areas. And that what we're looking at, and we're in the very early stages of discussion, is a way to still maintain some contact with youth in the uh, watershed. So we're looking at uh, having a number of wood duck boxes packaged up as kits. So all, all the pieces will be cut to size. Instructions will be included in the kit and the hardware as well. And we're hoping that we can work with uh, with Phil again out of your organization to manage the coordination where we'd have the youth apply and give us some reason why they want to participate. And then these kits could be handed out. We would ask the youth then to give us details and geospatial coordinates of where the, the uh, boxes were put up 
and then they could report back on an annual basis to us in terms of what the activity has been. So we're just at the very early stages of that discussion and you'll hear more shortly. Great, thank you very much, Don, for that update. Does anyone else have anything from their organizations that they'd like to share? Abraham, go ahead. So um, I think the most notable things that we've done, well, it was last week, actually, we had a World Wetlands Day uh, week of presentations and seminars. Um, it didn't go as well as we hoped it would. Uh, <laughs> uh, trying to put things online is really difficult. Um, uh, so what we're trying to do now in reaction to that is put them on YouTube and then hype up the prizes because we didn't have enough participation for the number of prizes we purchased. So I think it's a really interesting problem to have. Um, but also, I think more successfully, we implemented two intergenerational water dialogues through our partnership with the International Secretariat of Water, and we produced some of the some really great conversation amongst Aquas Oslono talking about our relationship with water and what water advocacy looks like to us and the meanings that it has to us and I'm really grateful for those conversations and we had a, quite a bit of participation in those conversations because we were able to get a clan mother to facilitate the conversation and to start it and then we went through a guidebook which was kind of boring but also produced a lot of really interesting questions and insights and really unpacking that dynamic between western institutions ways of approaching water advocacy versus the way that we would do it as Aquas Oslono. So, just wanted to share those kind of successes and learning lessons. <laughs> so uh, thank you. Thank you, Abraham. Anyone else? Well, I'll say that um, locally in North Grenville, which is sort of 30% South Nation watershed, um, we've got a group. The Council of Canadians has a thing they call Blue Communities where a, a municipal council decides that they're going to, they're not going to sell bottled water at municipal functions and they're not going to privatize their water system and they're going to consider good water, drinking water and, and sewage disposal as a, a human right for their, their citizens. Um, and, and this is all very anthropocentric and, and I've, I sort of got on the committee for this, and I've I've tried to push the idea of of healthy streams and um, and the idea that healthy plant communities make a net extraction of nutrients from precipitation. Um, and we're we're going along, proceeding with this to our our municipal council. Um, so that's that's similar to this this idea of. Uh, just the whole idea that, that the water, the whole flow of the watershed has to be taken into consideration, and it, it isn't just um, isn't just whether people have water to drink that's got too much chlorine in it to really be palatable, um, and and also um, I, I, the, the Ontario River Keeper is is doing a thing where they they measure the salt in water as a result of, of um, you know, salting the roads in the winter and finding that that some of these places are, are really pretty salty. And, and, and as some of you may know, there's places in Toronto where the ground, you know, under the, 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 the th freeways in Toronto where the, the groundwater is saltier than the ocean. Um, and so I've been pointing out to them that they're, there is residual Champlain Sea water in the groundwater in parts of the South Nation drainage, and so it's not just road salt that gets salt into our water. Um, and oh, various other, oh, we did and we did one thing um, where we actually were in the South Nation drainage, where we went along some of the hydro lines in Limerick Forest and found. Native, the native Phragmites along these old um, hydro lines, and and I'm working up the idea that, that this happened before the invasive. This was probably on earth moving machinery when the the lines were installed, which is probably sometime in the 1940s. 
And so this was before the invasive Phragmites was here. But in this case, the native Phragmites was being carried from stands in the headwater drainages nearby into these places where the hydro lines are being put in. Thank you, Fred. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none, we can touch on our watershed monitoring. And I did see an uh, email come in from Larry and a response from Fred, so I don't know if anybody else has anything to share or if Larry or Fred want to touch on um, the uh, email that came out this afternoon for a watershed report. And if you haven't sent, it in, sent yours in, fill it in and send it in. Go ahead, Larry. Fred, you ask uh, where I saw moose tracks. It would be uh, west of uh, Williamsburg uh, dump. Uh, cow in November, cow track in November, a bull track in late December, um, 18 west, east of there by about four kilometers was uh, a cow and a calf track. And then west of Monkland would have been a bull, a cow, and a calf track would be the three places that have bumped into tracks. Okay, has somebody transcribed that? Or if you could send that in an email so we'd have it in we, writing. We do have it in recording. I saw Michelle taking notes too because this is a species of interest for our NHS. Yeah. So. I didn't catch it all, but Larry, if you could email me those three, that would be great. And I'll make sure, sure to, to put it in with the, um, the feedback for the, the natural heritage system. I'll look at the SNC numbers, uh, land numbers. Oh, that'd be numbers. that'd be yeah. excellent. Thank you, Larry. You bet. So again, if you have additional watershed reports uh, for this past winter, please uh, send them around. Uh, if you don't have everyone's email, you can send them to myself, and I will make sure that they get distributed out to uh, to everyone. So if there is nothing further on that, we can move on to the date of the next meeting, which is June 1st. Uh, we'll be back on our normal Tuesday meeting schedule at 3 o'clock p.m. Um, it will be a virtual meeting. We're hoping that maybe by this fall we can actually move to in-person, but June at this point is planned for another virtual meeting like today. So if there's nothing further from anyone, we can look for a mover for adjournment. So I'll just do one last call for anything anyone wants to add before um, adjourning and I see Doug your hand Thompson your hand went up it was just for adjournment oh for adjournment well thank you Doug <laughs> <laughs> uh, I see Stefan's hand up no we went down again okay so I think we're good there's okay Stefan did you have something to add yeah just question uh, regarding what Naomi has uh, mentioned earlier about the uh, survey for the uh, Vernon Pool, like when when is this gonna start? Uh, in essence, is it uh, we looking around beginning of April, or uh, she was looking for volunteers maybe to uh, to help out doing doing some survey? Um, yeah, uh, probably end of March, early April, perhaps, depending on the weather. Actually, Fred, I it was usually the person that I rely on for letting me know when. That when they've started calling, um, but uh, that was more just to to ensure that I was heading out at the, around the right time. Fred, do you have any insight on what it might yeah, be like this spring? I will. It may be late this spring because we have so much snow. Um, I will send out a notice to the committee um, when I hear the first calling. Fair and, enough. Thank and then they call for. Oh, three weeks to a month and a half, depending on how the spring goes. Okay, I see Bill, your hand is up. Go ahead. Thank you very much. I th is it Naomi that mentioned earlier that she had uh, video, not videos, um, soundtracks of the, the different frogs, especially the course frogs? Yes. Uh, is that something that can be sent out uh, via the, the our computers, or is it how do we get that? I, I'm interested in that. Okay, I can uh, send that to the entire committee. Um, it's just um, the recordings, uh, I think they're YouTube recordings that it just uh, 
if you play them side by side, like one right after the other, you can really see the difference between um, the chorus frog and the spring peepers, because those are typically the two species that um, start calling early in the spring. And, and to be able to discern between the two, it's a little subtle variation in the, in the trill that they make. So um, it is pretty helpful to, uh, to help learn that difference. I'm interested in that. Okay, great. And the thing, the thing is that um, mostly peepers just peep, and that's where they get their name. Um, but there's certain conditions when they're starting to call in the spring, and and in agonistic sort of fights between two males, where the two males get too close together, they trill at each other. The peepers, and and the the chorus frogs have a sort of harsh grrrr, 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 and, and it's it's conventionally called running your fingers down the teeth of a comb. And, and the peepers have a, a sort of more musical, sweeter sounding trill. Um, but you really have to listen to a bunch of these. And, and when the frog watch, the frog watch program started, the recordings that they gave people to identify peepers just had the peeps. And so in 2012, Alita and I went all across the range of the chorus frogs, the northern range of the southern chorus frogs, of course, across southern Ontario. And there were all these frog watch records where there was just absolutely no habitat for chorus frogs. And there was this one place that was solid sugar maples, a 45 degree slope down into a lake and just no chorus frog habitat. And, and these were obviously people that didn't know that, that peepers trilled. And, and I, was, I was fortunate to learn this relatively early on when I was in Massachusetts and there was this chorus of peepers. I mean, there's no, there's no chorus frogs anywhere near Massachusetts. And, and this whole afternoon they were just trilling because they were starting up in the early part of the season. And um, we, Alita and I wrote a paper about that. Um, that's in the, and I think she's got most of it in her blog post, so I'll send that around about the different calls that peepers make when they're starting up. Thanks, Fred. Thank you. Great. So if there's nothing else, Mr. Chair, we do have Doug Thompson moving for adjournment. You'd like to call the final question? Yeah, so call the final question. <laughs> Hearing no Presumably. opposition to adjournment. So with that, thank you, everyone. I uh, wish you have a good evening. Take care. Right. And we'll see you in June. Oh, no. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Yeah, Take care. Oh, thanks, Rhonda. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for uh, taking that spot there, Fred. Okay, you're welcome. I, don't, I always wondered what you did with all those shells. <laughs>